All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, we are excited to have everybody join us today. We've got a really fantastic lineup of presenters. Um, we do have a tight timeline today of 30 minutes, so I'm going to move through some housekeeping slides as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, if you've got any questions, um, feel free to go ahead and think of them uh, and write them in the Q&A as we are uh, getting started, and we'll, we've saved some time at the end for your questions. Go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so our first uh, all right, maybe that's it. All right, so I'm happy to introduce Meg Crowley, and uh, Meg is the executive director with Stand to Reason. With, de with decades of leadership experience in marketing, she loves combining strategic planning and creativity to help build confidence and see results. We are also thrilled to welcome Lena Patel, and she serves as the vice president of development at Pan Foundation, one of Forbes' top 100 charities. Uh, she oversees all of Pan's fundraising efforts and has tremendous experience fusing together stewardship and acquisition. You'll see some examples of that in our creative today um, and those efforts that lead to sustained donors and giving. And then on uh, the client services side of the house, we we're thrilled to welcome uh, Kim Richardson, and she serves as the, as the Associate Vice President of Client Strategy. With a wealth of experience in both nonprofit and corporate marketing, Kim leads cross-channel fundraising strategy and program execution across multiple clients in faith, general nonprofit, and higher education verticals. And then last but certainly, certainly not least, we've got David Sacchetti. And David uh, serves as a director of client strategy, uh, and he joined Pursuant with experience spanning nearly two decades. Uh, he is responsible for driving results for his clients through building robust partnerships, understanding his clients' unique challenges, and using his marketing and fundraising background to help them achieve their goals and provide excellent client service. Um, and I know that David and Kim have some great uh, examples of client creative that they're going to be walking through with us today as we kind of uh, examine two uh, two sustainer giving programs that we're going to be um, sharing some best practices with you all today. Um, without any uh, further ado or preamble, I am uh, I'm thrilled to kick things over to Lena, who's going to be uh, sharing us some uh, some uh, examples from Pan's uh, Pan story with us. Go ahead in the next slide, Megan. Thank you. Thanks, Leah, and thank you guys for having me today. I'm excited to um, share a bit about the PAN Foundation, who we are and what we do. Um, PAN stands for the Patient Access Network Foundation. We're a national 501c3 organization that provides support to people who are um, typically older and financially vulnerable, and they have health insurance. It's still just not enough to be able to access and afford their prescription drugs. So we come in by assisting with their co-pays, their co-insurance and deductibles. And then we also advocate on behalf of the people that we serve for improved access and affordability. Um, we serve our patients through about 70 different disease funds here at PAN that fall within the chronic, rare, and oncology spaces. Um, but we also do provide more holistic support to the patient besides prescription drug assistance, such as supporting patients with affording their insurance premiums and then providing transportation assistance to get to and from their doctor's visits or to their pharmacies to be able to fill their prescriptions. Uh, we've been recognized by top rating organizations such as Forbes, uh, Candid, uh, Americans' Favorite Charities, Charity Navigator, and Great Nonprofits. And we will continue to do what we do until there is a long-term solution in place to ensure that everyone has equal access to their prescription drugs to be able to live whole and healthy quality of lives. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, at the PAN Foundation, historically, um, you know, we've seen great success in being able to help people largely due to our relationships with corporations and foundations. Um, about five years ago, it became obvious to us that we needed to touch base with our individual donor base and um, or build on the advocacy uh, or the advocates, excuse me, who were supporting us. And so we uh, partnered actually with Pursuant to grow and launch an individual giving program. Um, with at that time, we weren't doing much to market to that demographic of donors. You know, we we may have sent one or two solicitations, but there wasn't much beyond that. Um, 
we had some monthly donors at that time. We weren't starting entirely from scratch. And so as we saw the success of our individual donor program through our digital marketing efforts partnered with Pursuant, um, we also then started to explore the idea of launching a recurring gift program. Um, we, we saw that we had these sustained donors that we weren't making you know, concerted efforts to gain. And we decided that at least some segment of our pool of donors were, um, were dedicated to being able to support PAN in a sustained effort. And so we just thought, well, what if we actually put some effort into this? What, what growth could we experience? And how much could we educate the public about PAN and who we are and what we do? And so we made the transition from, um, at that time as well, from one payment platform to another by um, switching simply from a payment processor. We saw that, you know, having a more user-friendly solution, it resulted in natural growth in recurring gifts and donors. And essentially it served as a catalyst before we even put forth these efforts to build this recurring gift program. And that really showed us, you know, it speaks to the importance of a good user-friendly platform. Um, it spoke to the importance of removing as many barriers and distractions as possible to provide opportunities for giving gifts and to reduce the opportunities for abandonment. And then, you know, just making it easy and obvious to donate monthly, because once given an option, you know, many of your dedicated supporters are interested in doing it. We found that many didn't even realize there was an option to do so originally. Um, so we talked a lot about, you know, the benefits. What would this do for PAN? How would this serve us well? We spoke with our staff internally. We wanted to make this kind of an organization-wide endeavor. We spoke with our board of directors. And, you know, we really came up with some key reasons to be able to pursue this. Namely, you know, reliability in, in an increase in gifts to support PAN at minimal costs. Um, an increase in donor lifetime value, but then also increase in donor retention, of course and then strengthens our donors' loyalty to PAN and our, their engagement with PAN. Next slide, please. So coming up with the idea of this recurring gift program, a lot of thought and time was put into the branding of it. You know, we had a pretty strong um, presence with our brand in our digital fundraising marketing efforts. And then, you know, as a whole, who we are as PAN. And so our partnership with Pursuant was important in launching this program as we wanted to take a holistic approach to developing it. We really wanted to make sure that any communication that was being sent or disseminated was aligned with any other campaigns that we had going on at the time. Um, and so to in order, in order to ensure a successful program, when we were thinking of the brand of our organization, our program, it was important for us to make sure that our marketing and communications team was our best friend during that whole process. And so the collaboration between the departments was key to ensuring that integrated campaign, making sure that it was a seamless transition that, you know, anyone on the outside wasn't able to tell the difference between um, any communications that would be sent out in terms of who may have created them and how they were being disseminated. Um, we made the birth of our program a foundation-wide activity, as I mentioned earlier. So we solicited feedback from our colleagues about the name of the program. You know, what color scheme should we use that align with our brand? Should there be an icon that accompanies the, the name of our recurring program? And ultimately, it was the birth of our Pan Gems program, um, where the icon is a gem. And it was um, a great, it provided a greater sense of, interest in being able to see the success of the program and responsibility when uh, we involved the larger group in that way. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I'm gonna jump in here and build on what Lena was sharing um, around the launch of this program. So, uh, you know, Lena mentioned that Really, it was a, a, a an organizational wide effort at Pan to sort of create this program, and that was certainly the case when we um, worked with Pan to launch the program. So, building on our strong partnership and relationship over the last five years, we really. Um, partnered together collaboratively with all aspects of 
the organization at PAN to infuse the GEM program into everything that we were already doing on the individual donor side. And so, and so it was important to think of this holistically. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways for me is that, you know, we have a tendency to think in silos about individual donors and plain giving donors and major donors and um, sustainers. And when in fact, we need to be thinking much more holistically. And that's the approach that we took to launching the program. So we, we rolled up our sleeves in several sessions with PAN to talk about how we could infuse the launch of the GEM program into everything that we were doing from a fundraising and marketing, uh, in fundraising, excuse me, and in stewardship and engagement perspective. So we developed a quarterly schedule um, where we would ask the overall file if they'd like to become a pan gem. And we also agreed that we would still include the sustainers in all of the appeals that are part of the program throughout the year. Um, we would just limit the number of communications that they would receive. So no resends, no follow-ups, but giving them an opportunity to still get the campaigns and experience the stewardship and engagement offerings that we were giving to the whole file um, with customized, dedicated versions of all of their communications and speaking to them specifically with the relationship that they have with PAN and with the organization and giving them an opportunity for those single above and beyond gifts and making that case for support. As Lena mentioned, you know, these are some of your most passionate and loyal supporters. So they may be more than willing to participate beyond their monthly commitment, um, either in fund stewardship and engagement activities or with an additional above and beyond gift. So the next couple of slides show uh, some examples of this. So this was a fundraising campaign that we did in March um, that had a participation goal uh, tied to it, where we were looking for um, you know, a certain number of people to step up and give a gift to Pan. And you can see um, in the middle of the copy that we're infusing dedicated customized language for the gems along with their gem iconography. And we repeated that through all the different communications that we've had in our campaign since launching this at the beginning of the year, um, both from a fundraising and a stewardship perspective. So if you look on the next slide, here's another example where, you know, in a different campaign, we are giving them um, an invite to become a pan gem um, and talk about, you know, what some of their special benefits are and what, you know, what becoming a pan gem would do to support the mission of the pan foundation. And so, um, if you look on to the next slide, please, you can see that we also did this with our stewardship and engagement campaigns, where again, dedicated copy that with the iconography that references the gems as monthly supporters, but giving them an opportunity to um, feel the stewardship and engagement from PAN at the, the base level. And then um, the team at PAN is layering on top of this some additional more customized touches for the GEM donors. So it's sort of leveraging everything that we had in place for the individual 
digital donor program in a way to create that sort of baseline stewardship and touch points with the gems and then layering on top of that the additional touches that the pan team was doing to reach out to um, these most valuable and loyal supporters of the organization. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and just quickly, this is a snapshot of the dedicated space on the PAN main website um, for GEMS. Um, and this is an opportunity for people to come and check out why it's so important to become a GEM and um, meet some of the patients and provide some stewardship and recognition opportunities. Um, and having that dedicated space um, on your website is so important for people to be able to learn and understand how to um, how to interact with the organization if you're if you become a monthly supporter. So now I'm going to turn it over to Meg Crowley from State. Hi, welcome. Thanks, Lena and David. You really set the set the stage as showing the evolution on how you develop a program. So I'm gonna take it and be a little bit more pragmatic and show you our campaign. So Stand to Reason, our mission is to train Christians to think more clearly about their faith and make an even-handed yet gracious defense for classical Christianity. If you've ever felt tongue-tied when asked about what you believe, we equip you with um, content to read, watch, and listen, and that will help you to respond why Christianity is true in a confident and clear thinking way. So our philosophy since the beginning of Stand to Reason is about we give and then we ask. We've had a sustainer program um, since the inception 29 years ago, but have only identified, had a real official name for those donors um, for about 15 years. And from here on out, I'm going to use that official name as strategic partners. When we started the strategic partner program, we had levels of rewards. If you gave a certain amount, you would receive a reward. But we found that that did not motivate them at all what we found motivated them was Stand, Stand to Reason's mission. They wanted Stand to Reason to flourish because of what we do and to see that mission work. They wanted to be part of a movement. And now those strategic partners have become a true community. So as we go into um, developing a campaign for, our, for um, increasing those strategic partners, which we were, we, we were sort of stalled. Kim and Pursuant came along and said, we gotta do something. And so Kim is going uh, with the next slide, going to introduce how you identify those strategic partners. Great, thanks Meg. Yeah, um, as you, we walk through this next section here, Meg and I are kind of gonna tag team where I'll talk about a little bit of the best practice sorts of things. And then Meg will uh, talk to you about how it's come alive with the work that uh, Stand to Reason has done. So first off is really just identifying. And this has kind of evolved over the years in terms of how you identify those uh, potential sustainers as sustained giving has become such a big part of what um, donors expect. They're doing monthly subscriptions with all kinds of other things from Netflix to, to uh, their uh, grocery products, to the Amazon Prime and all of that. We're finding that um, while it's great, in particular, if you do in a direct mail campaign, um, in order to kind of make the best use of your financial resources when sending that campaign. It's great to identify maybe those donors who've given four gifts or more in a 12 month span. But when you're doing a digital campaign, you can send it to everybody because it's not costing you any more to do it. And we're finding that there are some donors who are brand new donors who are willing to convert to uh, recurring givings when they have found that affinity with your mission. 
Um, we know that some younger donors who are really ready to make an impact but can't you know, provide as large of a gift as some other donors are other prime um, candidates for your monthly giving program. On the flip side of that, so are older donors who are on that fixed income, but they still want to be a part of your mission. So it's um, those are just a few ways to identify, but we would certainly recommend if you're doing a digital campaign, let's go all out and, and we can send that message to everybody. Next slide. I think the other thing that's super critical um, as you think about uh, your monthly giving program is planning, both for the overall program as well as for a focused catalytic campaign um, that we would recommend maybe one to two times per year, similar to what you do at calendar year in where you're introducing this really big um, campaign and pulling out all the stops to tell your supporters about it. So. First of all, you're wanting to lay out that timing. Um, we recommend it's a couple times a year we've seen successful the January, February timeframe as people are coming into that new year, they have those new, year, new year's resolutions and some of them are about supporting important missions. So that's a prime time um, as well as uh, at the back end of the summer. So that August, September timeframe um, works really well also for this, um, this type of campaign. And we've even seen some of our clients use uh, Giving Tuesday timeframe as a time to elevate sustained giving. So looking at where the timing works in your total communication calendar is what you'll wanna do. Again, just like a calendar year in campaign, you'll wanna pull out all the stops and activate all the channels um, for this important effort. And then during the campaign, providing those updates uh, at how things are progressing you heard um, Lena talk about the goal uh, that they set for the number of participation. So you'll wanna, throughout that campaign, you'll wanna give those donors an update on what's happening because it builds excitement and momentum. And then finally, when it's all over, thank, 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 thank. This is, a, this is an important effort for your organization. It's a behavior that somebody is really giving you access to either a bank account or credit card. So it is critically important that you thank them for the dedication that they're bringing to your organization. Next, next uh, slide. So that plan that um, Kim just explained was exactly the plan that we started in the beginning of 2018. Again, I said that we were at a place where our strategic partners, we had stalled. We were, we were not gaining ground and we were sort of losing a little bit of ground too. But what we did realize is that those that were strategic partners wanted our mission to flourish. And so with Kim and the help of, of uh, Pursuant, we decided on a timing for, the, for our campaign. And we decided on August because it was after the summer slump. And it was before we started with our uh, student ap apologetic conferences. So it was right in between there where we could give it that dedicated time. We developed the campaign goal, the theme and the look. And it took us a minute to do this. We have an excellent um, team of creatives and an awesome uh, graphic designer. We came up with be one of the 100. And so that not only talked about what the goal was at the time, but it also gave each person that sense of ownership. Uh, we defined the incentive that drove that urgency. And like I said before, our donors don't want that reward. We, we train and we equip, and that's what our donors wanna do. Those strategic partners want us to keep equipping, keep training. So our very first year, we, um, our incentive was we'll take your first month of donation and we will sponsor a student to come to our student apologetics conference. That was an incentive for them. In the years past, since we've started this in 2018, the incentive has been sign up to be a strategic partner, and we will send teaching and equipping resources to your pastor, to your youth leader. So it's not necessarily for them. 
but it's doing that mission. They are other oriented and that really seemed to um, resonate with them so that they could help our mission to flourish. Then we worked on a multi-channel uh, campaign and uh, why don't we go to the next page so I can just show you a little bit of what we've done. As you can see, we, one of the 100 was branded on everything that we did. The premium that we had that was, was the giveaway to the pastor or youth leader. We sent numerous emails. We had this banner on our website on other digital uh, presence that we had. Social media everywhere, every platform. Uh, we have a radio program and we had the announcements for Be One of the 100 the whole month of August. And we actually had strategic partners to come on and, and give um, an interview. Why are they a strategic partner? Why do they believe in Stand to Reason? We've had, we had board members on to give that credibility for who we are and where are we going? And then, you know, surprise and delight, put something in their mailbox. We did postcards that kind of got caught people and uh, the postcards started really um, during some of the pandemic. And who didn't want to go to their mailbox during the pandemic? It was, it was actually a journey for people. And so that postcard did surprise and delight others um, as, as we were doing our August campaign. Next, Kim. So, yes, so you saw some of the great work that um, Stand the Reason has done with that campaign and um, it's been in place for three years. And interestingly, we kept the Be One of the 100 campaign because even, and we kind of wavered with it during the um, pandemics, like will people really want to sign up? And we decided to stick to it. And every year we've had more than 100 people sign up. Um, it's been a growth that we've seen. And so as we think about that and having these great campaigns, the most important thing too, and it's just extremely critical, is that that follow-up and donor experience that once people make that commitment, how are they treated? What, what is their path or their journey afterwards? We talked about that media thank you that's obviously very critical as this dedicated, this person is uh, committed to dedicated giving. Um, also making sure that these, um, that these donors know who that they, they can call. We really recommend having that dedicated staff person for the program, um, a real person that someone can reach by email, by phone, um, because they're trusting you with a financial instrument, their credit card or their bank account. So we don't want to send them to info at, you know, xyznonprofit.com. We want them to be able to talk to a real person and get their issue handled um, right away. Also, um, the idea of having these different special touches. We've seen some um, organizations uh, start this program and it may or may not have benefits. We've seen having some kind of benefits. Now, the benefits don't necessarily mean, um, you know, branded swag or whatever. Again, these are folks who are bought in. So really some of the things that we found be really successful for retention are, you know, some kind of annual impact report or contribution statement, um, making sure that you maybe edit the kind of uh, the, the amount of communication that they receive from you. While there is going to be, you know, times like calendar year in or fiscal year in or special appeals that we send to them, it may mean that they don't necessarily now have to get every appeal from you, even though many of them are willing to give that over and above gift. So they should get some, but depending on your mission, you may want to edit what that communication frequency looks like. Providing surveys, getting that feedback, understanding how they can be served better or some of the things, just hearing from them because they, again, are your very best supporters. And so there might be things they can tell you about that could be blind spots. So they, their input is really important. Um, and then finally, these are gonna be some of your best plan giving uh, candidates. So as you think about your communication strategy to them, as you're, you're planning your plan giving, and I know a lot of organizations are joining up with uh, services like freewill.com, make sure you're talking to this group about this, uh, about your efforts in that uh, arena as well. 
Next slide. So here's how we uh, retain our strategic partners. And we have found that our strategic partners, um, one of the things that they really love is access to our, our speakers, to our staff. And when we have conferences, we coincide a donor breakfast at these six different conferences. And our donors are invited to come, they're invited to participate in the conference, but it's a morning, it's a Saturday morning when they can be up close and personal. They hear a little bit of a state of the union, but they also have time just to ask questions. They have time to talk with our speakers and those of us on the staff. And to have that access is just, is so important. And when we invite them, it's just a plain text email from our donor relations coordinator. And she is phenomenal. You can see her um, up there, our dedicated staff, Ocean. Everybody knows Ocean. She calls herself your gal on the inside. She is trusted because just like what Kim said, she is managing the money, but she's also managing that relationship. We have prayer requests. When somebody has to cancel, there's no shame involved. She is the one that they go to and have that relationship with. Probably Ocean may be one of the most popular people on our staff for everyone because everyone does know her and she creates those relationships and truly keeps them going. Um, our strategic partners, they get two gifts a year. And, and that is something that is a, a, re, a resource that nobody else gets access to. It is created specifically for them. And then as Kim talked about, you know, that uh, impact report, when someone becomes a strategic partner, they also get access to a strategic partner Facebook page. And I have to tell you, community is built there. Not only do people have a safe place to go to, you know, ask questions, but they also have a safe place to go to say, you know, I have been given this question, how do I respond to it? Or, you know, guys, I'm having a rough time at work. So they have truly become that community. So it's, it's not just getting training, but it, it becomes much more personal. Um, so we've got that community page, we give gifts, we have ocean, and we want them to know that they are the VIP without them without them, stand to reason really um, cannot move forward. Kim? Okay. So here's the most exciting part. So, uh, and why <laughs> Meg is talking about how important this group is. Um, I think what Stand to Reason has done through the years and the impact of focused attention uh, to sustain giving has been phenomenal for their organization. So today, strategic partners actually account for 62% of Stand to Reason's annual income. That's huge. That's dollars that they can count on. Um, and with those other dollars, they can look at what are the things that we can do to, to make our mission even bigger and extend it and to add uh, additional content and all those other things. Over time, we've also seen the average gift that's given by these strategic partners increase. Um, when we look at the beginning of this campaign and where we are today, they have increased their strategic partners by nearly 40%. And then finally, these are really, really sticky donors. And what we have found that they are retaining their strategic partners at about 88% every year. So it, to, to say it's a significant group for the organization would be an understatement. So we're so excited for the things that have um, been accomplished with this long-standing program and how we've been able to uh, plus it up even more through some of our real specific efforts around campaigns. Now, finally, let's go ahead and uh, get to really the reflection on, as you think about your own program and um, consider if you're starting one or even if you have one in place, some things that you need to think through. So number one is how often are donors asked to become a monthly partner? You heard David say that, um, that when they started the program, once they had introduced kind of that major campaign, after that, it was just really important that they incorporated those gems 
into everything that they were doing. So it should be passively on every appeal in some kind of way, and then some kind of catalytic campaign uh, where you're asking uh, specifically two, a couple times a year. How long before that new donor is asked to become a monthly partner? I think it really depends on your mission. There's in some ways you can go out directly with that message. I think if you are doing a digital campaign, you should definitely do that. There's no cost to you to, to do that beyond just the work that, that it requires. But um, as, as monthly giving becomes much more popular, it's, it's not unusual to ask a new donor right away to become a, uh, a monthly partner. When I think about Stand to Reason, they have a lot of content that people kind of have to experience and, and see if this is something that's for me before people you know, maybe make that commitment to give a single gift or become a strategic partner. Um, but I think, again, if you're having that digital campaign, why not ask? Because you're going to get some conversion right up front. Um, how well do you communicate what will be accomplished with your monthly donations? That's really critical as well. People need to know, if I make this commitment to, to you, how does it change the trajectory of what your organization is doing? So be sure to have, have thought through that so you can communicate that as a part of your campaigns. Um, how clearly are your... Um, benefits communicated. Again, it doesn't take a whole lot of benefits, but there are some things like access or surprise and delight gifts um, that are really important. Um, having that dedicated person, you'd be surprised how important that is to your monthly uh, sustainer. So making sure that you communicate some of those things is a part of why people should be a part of it. It's as much a part of the case for support as your mission. So be sure to communicate those things. Um, Part of that, again, too, is who they can contact if they have a problem. So we talked a little bit about having a dedicated person. And then finally, are you communicating the opportunity that um, an impact of giving an upgraded amount? We've had a lot of our clients, in, even in that annual catalytic campaign, the messaging to current uh, sustainers might be, if you could just increase your gift by X amount, we could do X. So being able to make sure that you think through what is, what is it that we can do if we just were able to grow the amount of revenue that comes from our monthly sustainers and then be able to communicate that to your donors who are already a part of your program. So again, hopefully this has been super helpful for you as you think through the things that you're doing already or the things that you wanna put in place. We're here as pursuant to um, also be a resource to you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Leah? Sorry guys, my uh, uh, unmute button got buried between a, a, behind a few different windows. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to Lena and Meg and David and Kim. Um, you guys have uh, laid out a really great, um, some really great examples of monthly giving, um, as well as some uh, tactics for uh, optimizing it if you already have a program. Um, we do have some a little bit of time. Um, our, our speakers are gonna hang around for a few extra minutes to answer some questions if you have them. Um, and so if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box now. Um, and then I've got a little bit of additional information and some resources for you as you um, head out to the rest of your day. Next slide, please. Um, if you are curious and you showed up today and you saw two logos, Giving DNA and Pursuant, um, we wanted to uh, just clear, uh, to give a little bit of explanation there. So Giving DNA and Pursuant are um, two sides of the same, of the same coin um, The uh, you've heard uh, a lot of the stories of Pursuant here of how um, we partner with clients like um, the Pan Foundation and Stand to Reason to um, optimize their campaigns um, and to deliver those appeals. Um, and the other side that you didn't see as much today is Giving DNA. Uh, and Giving DNA is a donor engagement platform that helps you see stories in your data and segment your donors into, um, into highly, highly targeted groups so that you can send really personalized communications to them. And if you see on the next slide, um, one of those uh, capabilities is the ability to see those sustainer candidates that are already in your file who have yet to be asked and are likely to uh, make a monthly, become a monthly supporter um, if they are not already. Uh, if you would like to see those capabilities um, or to learn more about how Pursuant and Giving DNA partner together, we welcome you to use that QR code to go ahead and uh, see it for yourself. Uh, and you can grab time with one of our representatives uh, to learn more about it. Next slide, please. Um, 
if we have no more, if we've got no questions, um, I think we can go ahead and wrap up for the day. Thank you everyone who took some time and stayed on a little bit longer to um, see the entire presentation. You will be receiving the recording and the slides in your inbox tomorrow. Uh, so there's something you would like to go back and review or some slides you wanted to write your notes directly on, you'll be getting that in your inbox tomorrow. Uh, once again, to uh, Lena, Meg, David, and Kim, thank you so much for um, putting this presentation together for our viewers. Um, I saw everybody hanging on till the very end. So yeah, thank you so much for, for that content. And thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right. That's Thanks. it for today. <laughs>